So today, okay, as we said before, last material for the biology unit, and we're going to go over some stuff that's probably common sense, okay, um, the factors that affect plant growth, so the things that affect the growth of a plant. This might be a little bit helpful for you for your plant transport lab, because usually the things that affect plant growth affect it because they affect how photosynthesis works, so okay, something to consider there. Um, and the rest of it will be for our in-class activity on Thursday. Okay, so it'll be important there. And of course, there'll be some questions on the unit exam about it. So we've got to learn the components that affect plant growth, and we need to understand how those components affect plant growth. Okay, so there's two groups that these components can fall into. Biotic, that's the living parts, and abiotic, the non-living parts. Okay, so we'll be looking at both. So in this picture here, okay, what are some abiotic factors that you see that could affect the growth of a plant? Sun. Sun, absolutely. Plants won't grow without it. What else? The rocks. Okay, the rocks, yeah, because when rocks break down, they make soil. Okay, and soil is important for plants. Uh, rain. Rain, yeah, got to have water. Plants need that. Okay, what else? Okay, soil, yeah, definitely the components of the soil. Okay, the mineral components. There's some other stuff that's in the soil that's a biotic component. What would this stuff be? Decomposers, yeah, okay, like little bacteria and things like that. Okay. Um, Another thing, it's hard to, it's not really that you see it, that it's on there, but temperature. There's no snow in the picture, and well, when it's below freezing, plants don't grow. Okay? Even evergreens, okay, like the spruce trees in the, in the mountains and stuff like that, if it's frozen out, they're not growing. They can't carry out photosynthesis if they can't transport water, which would freeze. Okay? So they're not going to be doing that either. Okay, so abiotic components, temperature, huge factor. Okay, without it, without like a non-freezing temperature, basically nothing happens for plants. Okay, because it affects biological processes. Most organisms, with the exception really of birds and mammals, have no ability to regulate their temperature. Okay, they are at the whim of their surroundings in terms of uh, temperature. Temperature affects a lot of metabolic processes in both plants and animals. Okay. Certain proteins can denature at either really high or really low temperatures. And by denature, I mean they change their shape and don't work properly. Okay. That especially applies to hormones, which are generally proteins. At high temperatures, they denature. They change their shape and don't operate properly. And the same thing happens at low temperatures. Okay. Low temperatures can also influence the rate at which cellular respiration can occur, as do high temperatures. All of these processes are very temperature dependent. Okay. Uh, having the ability to control those, uh, your, your body's temperature is important for being able to regulate how much you grow and how much energy you have and stuff like that. Okay. That's why mammals are typically the most advanced organisms on the planet. They have the ability to regulate their temperature and operate through a wider range, okay, as opposed to other types of organisms. Okay, also for plants, if it gets really hot, they lose too much water. Okay, and if they're losing a lot of water, it's hard for them to maintain the process of photosynthesis because their stomates will close and photosynthesis will stop. Okay, obviously if it's too cold, then yeah, the water freezes and that can rupture their cells and obviously it can't be transported in a solid form. Okay, second thing, water. Plants need it. But it's not just having water, it's also the quality of the water. Okay? If I water a plant with, I don't know, coffee, okay, it's not going to be as healthy as a plant that would be watered with like even tap water. Okay? Uh, now, if I water a plant with tea, it'll actually be really happy. Because tea is made from what? What's in tea? Yeah, nutrients and stuff are in there, but tea is made from leaves. 
So when you make tea, basically you're just kind of speeding up the decomposition process of the tea leaves. And when you pour that water in there, it's got all the minerals and nutrients that would have been in those tea leaves. Okay? And so it'll actually do pretty well. Coffee, on the other hand, is quite acidic. Okay? And if you put anything else in it, okay, that's also generally not good because it can promote the growth of fungus and stuff like that within the plant. Trust me, I know I've watered plants with both. Because I'm a science guy. How many do that kind of stuff? I used to just throw my like leftover coffee on the plants because they don't have a sink in here. I didn't like it. I, I like it because it makes me awake and happy and plants don't like that. Okay. Uh, so water is important. It needs to have, obviously we need it for hydration. Plants need it for hydration, but they also need it because it's the only way they can absorb minerals. Okay. The minerals come into the plants in solution in the water that they take up. Okay. Sunlight. Now, sunlight is obviously the energy source for photosynthesis, and without that, plants could not survive. But the thing is, is that it's rarely dark all the time. I mean, unless you live above the Arctic Circle, and then it is dark all the time for a few months of the year. Okay? But it's not just the light that you get. It's the quality, intensity of the light that can make a difference. Okay. So if we're looking at um, like a year on the Earth, what do we have during the year? We have seasons. Exactly. We have seasons. Why do we have seasons? How like far we are away from the sun, how far we are to. Okay. Um, I get that answer a lot. It's actually a very common answer. And while Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle, and we actually do move closer to and further away from the sun, it's actually not what causes the seasons. In fact, we're closer to the sun in the wintertime for us. Okay? It's summertime in the southern hemisphere. Okay? But our perigee, where we're closest to the, to the sun, actually occurs in the wintertime. What causes the seasons is the fact that the Earth is not straight up and down. Okay? We always picture the Earth kind of like this, and it spins on its axis like this. Except the Earth's axis is only like that two days a year. What two days is it like that? The equinoxes. We just had one. Okay? March 21st, the spring equinox. That's when the Earth is straight up and down okay, while it goes around the sun. Okay? And the other time will be September 21st fall equinox. That would be the other day of the year where the Earth is straight up and down. The rest of the year, the Earth wobbles okay, back and forth. Okay? Its axis is actually tilted. Right? So if this is the Sun, okay, Earth goes from looking like this to looking like this. Now I know you think I drew that the same way. I did. But what I want you to imagine is this is the line that divides night and day. It's called the terminator. It's a great name. Okay? But it, it's the line that, and that divides day and night. So this is the North Pole. This is the South Pole. Still the same over here. The Earth wobbles back and forth, but it doesn't flip upside down. Okay? We would be located, you know, right about here. So when the Earth rotates on its axis, okay, how much do we get into the sun? Because our path, as the Earth rotates, would look something like this. How much time do we spend in the sun? Not a lot. Not a lot. Okay. Over here, okay, we're in the same place. Now how much time do we spend in the sun? A lot. Okay. These are the solstices. This is the winter solstice. This is my favorite day of the year. Summer solstice. The sun comes up at 4 a.m., goes down about 11.30. Okay. Lots and lots of sunshine. Okay. And that's because the Earth is tilted. 23 and a half degrees from vertical. Okay, that's more than one quarter of the way from vertical to horizontal. Okay, 
So 23 and a half degrees off kilter. So as the Earth goes around and around the sun, okay, if you're not at the equator or near the equator, the length of your day changes significantly. Okay? Between December 21st and March 21st, okay, we go from having about six and a half, seven hours of daylight to having 12 hours. Okay, because on March 21st and September 21st on the equinox, the Earth is straight up and down. Okay, on both of those days. Straight up and down. Okay, so when it spins around, everybody gets 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of night. As we move towards June 21st, the Earth's no the North Pole tilts towards the sun. So when the Earth spins around and around, we spend more time in the sun. Okay, and we get that like 18 and a half hour day. Here we get 18 and a half hours of sunshine, like four and a half, or five and a half hours of, of uh, darkness. Okay? If you're at the North Pole, this is the time of the year where the sun never sets. Okay? In fact, it looks really cool. If you've ever seen like a time lapse of a day at the North Pole on the summer solstice, the sun goes around in a ring. It goes around like this because it doesn't set, but the Earth's still spinning under it, so it looks like the, like the sun goes around in the sky in a circle. It's really fun. Okay? Whereas on December 21st, you don't get to see the sun. In fact, you don't get to see the sun from about November 21st till about the middle of January. Okay? They call those the dark times in the northern part of the world. All right, does that sort of make sense? Okay, so the amount of light that, mo that plants receive if they're not right at the equator changes. If you are right at the equator, the fact that the Earth is tilted really doesn't make any difference. Okay? How many of you have heard of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Cap? Really? You're supposed to have heard those words before. Okay, anyway, okay, they're like these little imaginary lines of latitude on the Earth. Between those two lines, which happen to be 23 and a half degrees above the equator and 23 and a half degrees below the equator, the length of day does not change, at least not significantly. Okay, so they get the same amount of sun all year round. Also happens to be where you find rainforests and things like that because plants can survive and their weather really doesn't change very much. Okay. As soon as you get above those, the length of day starts to change okay, significantly. In fact, here it changes so significantly that we change our clocks twice a year to account for it. Okay. Now you may or may not like daylight savings time. People whine and moan about it. Two days of the year deal with it. Okay. It's important for one very simple reason. As the days get shorter, it's dark longer. And for safety, it's important to have when children are getting on the bus for it to be light so that they're more visible. Okay. Very simple safety reason for doing that. Okay. All right. So if, if the amount of light changes for you, you have to adapt to that because light is your source of energy. Okay. So plants do a number of things to adapt to that. Okay. Plants will make sure that they're doing the bulk of their flowering shortly after the maximum daylight. Okay, because that's when they have the most energy to put into fruit. Because okay? what are fruits made of? Well, they have a lot of them. A lot of in them. Seeds. Okay, they have seeds. Hopefully not a lot because then sugar. sugar. Yeah, they're mostly sugar. That's why they're appetizing. That's why we eat them. Okay, um, but where does that sugar come from? It comes from photosynthesis. So when plants are going to make fruit, they got to do it when they have the most energy okay, to make those fruits with. So we do it in the hottest and longest days of the year. Okay? And as days get shorter, we get towards the equinox, plants start to go dormant. Okay? Because they recognize length of day shortening signals cold coming. It's the most reliable factor to tell plants when to go dormant. Because a little cold snap, you don't want to rely on temperature. If you get a little cold snap and go dormant, that can happen in August. Okay? Like we've gotten frost and even snow. Okay, very early on in, in September or very late in August sometimes. So we don't want to rely on temperature to say, oh, it's time to go dormant when you still have weeks okay, of good weather left. So it's always length of day that cues that. Same with geese. Okay? You've been noticing that the geese have been coming back here over the last couple of weeks? Length of day. Okay? Their, their migration patterns are triggered by length of day. They start practicing okay, in the fall, early fall, like late September. And they're gone by November. Okay? But it's the length of day that tells them it's time to go. 
not temperature. That's why sometimes you see them swimming in the river and there's snow everywhere. Okay? It's not that they're dumb. It's the, the days aren't short enough for them to go yet. Okay? That's what tells them when to go. It's also what signals like uh, mating events for animals, okay? uh, and like I said, flowering, which is kind of mating for plants. Okay? Um, all of that stuff is light related because light is the source of energy. Okay? So light's super, super important. Okay, wind. Here's one we don't often think about, but wind affects plant growth. Okay? Um, not so much that it makes it faster or slower, but it dictates where the plant grows and how the plant grows. Okay? How many people have ever been down to like Lethbridge, Pincher Creek, you know, where the wind farms are and stuff? Ever look at the trees down there? You notice they all grow to the east? They all lean this way. Why? Was there a lot of down there? Wind, yeah. Okay. Lots and lots of wind. Lethbridge is like the migraine capital of the world per capita. Okay. Chinooks cause migraines. Okay. And, uh, and they get more per capita cases in Lethbridge okay, than anywhere else. Like Calgary would be like second. Okay. Uh, so wind can cause trees as kind of a type of thigmotropism to change where they grow their branches. Okay? So if you're looking at like a poplar tree or even a spruce tree down in Pincher Creek, Lethbridge kind of area, it's naturally going to grow like this. Okay? Wind coming from this direction, they slant that way. Because any branches they grow on this side have way more torque on them. They're more likely to get broken and things like that. So they tend to grow a little bit that way. Okay? You also see it in mountain passes. Okay? Um, Douglas firs and other types of spruce trees, okay? uh, in this case, this is an Engelmann spruce, okay? they grow in what's called a crummels form in the mountain passes. And it's because of wind. They actually, so this plant here, it's kind of hard to see, okay? but if we were looking at it from the top, so this circle is its trunk, all of its branches are on this side. There are no branches on this side, and this is the direction the wind comes from. Okay. Now, as wind hits something, obviously it's slowed down and its direction changes, but it causes a bit of a vortex. Okay. So what happens is, as the wind hits here, it gets directed around the trunk and then does this, and kind of vortexes a bit around the back side of the trunk. If this wind is carrying a lot of snow, where will the snow gather? Yeah, in the branches. As the, as the wind gets slowed down, its ability to hold the snow up decreases and the snow falls out. Okay? And so this kind of acts almost like a snow fence. Okay? And it'll create a drift that will cover and protect the tree from cold temperatures that they would experience being at a really high altitude. Okay? So they grow in this weird form. What they actually look like from the side is this. Okay? They would only grow branches here. This side would be like bare trunk. Okay? And they'll just catch all the wind. They protect these branches from the wind okay? because their trunk acts like a wind deflector and protects the branches on the other side of it from being broken off. Okay, and then it acts like a snow fence in the winter to create a drift around the tree that protects it from cold temperatures. Okay? So wind can be a pretty important factor in growth okay, in terms of the thigmotropism response, but it also increases the rate of evaporation. Okay? So I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you've like, gone to Stampede, okay, I know you probably haven't done that many for a couple of years, but if you did before, okay, they sometimes have these big, like, cooling gates where if you walk through them and you get this fine mist of water on you, okay? And as soon as you get that fine mist of water on you, you, you walk away and you suddenly feel cooler, okay? Because as the water evaporates, it cools you off, okay? And if, you're, if it's a windy day, the rate of evaporation goes up and you cool faster. That's why we use fans, okay? You ever wonder why a fan makes you feel cooler? Okay? It's because it increases the rate at which your sweat evaporates so you cool faster. Okay? That's why sitting in front of a fan on a hot day feels good. 
Okay? Or even if you're just like sitting in the sun and you're baking hot, get up and walk around. Just that little bit of air movement past your skin will actually increase the rate at which your, pers your perspiration evaporates and cool you faster. Okay? But obviously losing water faster for a plant can be a concern. So windy environments can also also be drier. Okay? Uh, and it also causes wind chill. Okay? Now for plants, wind chill is not terribly concerning. I mean, it still involves evaporation, okay? But for us, wind chill is a big deal, okay? It's, you know, when it's minus 30 outside, and they go, yeah, it's minus 30, but it feels like it's minus 45 because it's blowing 50 kilometers an hour, okay? The reason it feels colder is because when water evaporates from your skin, it creates a cooling effect. So if you have exposed skin and it's 30 below, and then you've got wind blowing on it, the moisture in your skin will evaporate and make it feel even colder. Okay? That's what wind chill is, which is why we find a lot and don't have any exposed skin, okay? because it can freeze and you can get frostbite way faster. Okay, rocks and soil, right? So physical structure, pH, mineral composition, okay? uh, things like that can all affect how fertile a soil can be. Okay? Um, soil comes from not only the decomposition of living organisms, but also the decomposition of rocks. As rocks weather, little bits of them fall off and that can collect and gather and form soil. That is not a fast process. We are talking tens of thousands of years okay, to build up any significant soil. Right? Um, so this soil here, do you suppose it's old or young? What do you see a lot of in the picture? Rocks. If soil comes from the decomposition of rocks, and I see lots of them there, is the soil old or young? Young, okay? This soil is very young. This is soil that is above the tree line in the mountains, okay? So it's very, very young. It has not been free of glaciers for more than maybe a few thousand years tops. So there hasn't been a lot of time for the, the the rocks to weather and wear and build up soil particles, okay? So, um, you can see this little trowel that I stuck in the ground here, okay? There's actually a rock behind it holding it up because that's as far into the dirt as I could put it. Okay? That's how deep the dirt was, right? It's not that there was like one rock there, like I tried in a bunch of places, you can see it, it's all dug up, okay? It, there was, that's where the bedrock was. I could not go any deeper than that. So the soil was only about this thick. Okay. If I only have soil about an inch and a half to two inches thick, am I going to grow a big forest? No. Big mature trees need lots of moisture, lots of soil nutrients, and they need to anchor themselves to something. Okay. This is only going to grow what you see here. Little scrubby plants and grasses, because that's all it can support. It's not very thick. Okay. So soil is a big part of it. The quality, depth. Okay, age of your soil is all is all stuff that can influence what plants can grow in that area. Okay, what happened here? Fire, yeah. Okay. Forest fire happened here. Okay, um, forest fires, while obviously destructive, are important. Okay. And I'm not trying to say that you know, global warming is not happening or climate change isn't a real thing or anything like that, but I'm saying fires are important. They're a natural occurrence. They are what we call a periodic disturbance. Okay. We've been getting a lot of forest fires around here in the past few years. Okay. And I'm not going to say that climate change doesn't have something to do with that. I'm sure it does. What also has something to do with that is that most of the forests in our area are very, very old. Okay? They're just, this is the natural cycle of things. The only way to quickly rejuvenate a very old forest is for it to burn. Okay? Burning it will kind of get rid of all these tall trees more quickly, put a lot of ash on the ground, which is important for nutrients. But what it'll also do is for a lot of um, pine trees, it's the only way their seeds are released. Okay. Spruce trees, when they drop their cones, a lot of them, encoat the cone in a resin. Okay. 
Uh, so it won't, the seeds won't come out. It's coated in this like sticky, like watertight material. The only way that their seeds get released is if that resin gets burnt. Okay? So a fire comes through, these cones are either still hanging in the tree or they're on the ground. As the fire comes through, the resin burns off and the pine cone cracks open, releasing the seed. Now, new pine trees can grow. Okay? And they like to grow in the shadows of their parents. Okay? Their, their parents aren't blocking the light anymore because they've been burnt and more light gets down to ground level. Okay? Not so much that they get cooked, but enough that they can you know, grow safely and not be too dried out or anything like that. And as they get bigger, that's a slow process, more and more of the burnt trees fall down and make more sunlight available. Okay? So a periodic disturbance like a forest fire, while destructive and you know, yeah, it certainly ruins the natural beauty of the area, is important long term for that ecosystem. It's the only way all the nutrients that are tied up in the trees can be cycled back for new growth. Because as trees age, they become diseased, they, you know, they get, you know, they die, whatever, and they're just standing there. Okay? Fire is important in order to help cycle that back. We actually um, made a big mistake for almost 100 years in the national parks. Every time there was a fire, we made absolutely every effort to put it out. Absolutely every effort. Never let any fires happen if we could control it. And all that did was make a huge supply of fuel. Because we were preventing fires in places where fires were supposed to happen. All the trees were old or dead or sick or pine beetle had gone through and killed them all or whatever. Okay? And so they needed to go. But if we keep preventing them, then eventually all you have is a ton of fuel and then a fire gets going and there's nothing you can do to stop it no matter what you do. And that's what we've seen over the last little while is our, our fire prevention efforts have actually made things worse. Okay? So now, sometimes forestry departments will cause intentional burns. Okay? They'll go in and dig like a big barrier around uh, a section of forest and they'll intentionally burn. Okay? Just to cycle it through. And so it's important to have those trees there while the new trees germinate. This is actually why um, the trees that are planted in clear-cut areas don't do as well. Okay? Um, logging companies will often uh, say, you know, we plant two or three trees for every tree we cut down. Okay? And that sounds great. You know, it's great that they do that. They have to do that because only about half of them are actually going to live. Okay? You've cut down the trees that are supposed to still be standing there. So the little saplings are in the blazing sun. Okay? And the little pine saplings don't really like a lot of direct sunlight. It's too much for them. They're supposed to be growing in the shadow of a bunch of dead trees. So a lot of them don't make it, so they actually do have to plant sometimes twice or three times as many trees as they cut down just to make sure they get that forest back. All right, other types of periodic disturbances. Floods, okay, floods can greatly change an ecosystem. Okay, we, I don't know if you guys remember because you were pretty young, okay, uh, but in 2013 when we had the big floods around here, it vastly changed the floodplains around all the rivers. Okay, it took out everything, stripped it right down, okay, uh, and all that stuff grew back up because when the waters receded, what was left was this sludge. Okay? And it was all the sediment and stuff like that that had been washed down from other places. It's full of nutrients. It's a great soil for things to grow in. It's also why it was so bad in people's houses, because it's a great nutrient-rich environment in which mold and bacteria can grow. So you've got to get rid of it. Okay? But in a natural ecosystem, it's one of the best things you can have. So floods, yes, they take out a bunch of stuff, but they also redistribute the nutrients in a different way. Okay? And that's what most natural disturbances do. They redistribute the available nutrients. Um, a volcanic eruption, depending on the type, can be um, like kind of a regrowth opportunity. So if you get the kind of volcanic eruptions that uh, we generally get in North America, or they would get in like Italy and Greece and places like that, where there's a lot of ash but not a lot of liquid rock coming out, those all that ash contains tons of nutrients. That's why there's so many like vineyards and and nutrient intense growing operations going on in like Greece and Italy, okay? Um, whereas um, if it's liquid, liquid rock coming out, well then you're kind of starting from scratch, 
Okay, if you encase everything in a big you know, black rock, it's not really great. Okay, that's starting over. Okay, and then that's the that's the last of the abiotic ones. We're looking at biotic things. So all the living parts of an ecosystem that can affect a plant. So a lot of that is going to be decomposers. Okay, worms, bugs, bacteria, fungus. All of that stuff helps to decompose living things and and recycle their nutrients. Okay, um, so like we said, that could be you know bugs, that could be bacteria, it could be fungus. Okay, has anyone ever like come across these things, carpenter ants? Okay, you usually find them in a rotten tree, okay, or a rotting tree. Okay, um, they really help to decompose trees quickly because they essentially eat them from the inside. And they can turn a tree into sawdust. They're kind of the north, the northern equivalent of a termite. Okay, we don't have termites here, but termites are a big problem in tropical areas. Okay, um, but they, the carpenter ants will just eat the tree until it falls over. Or if you're like me, when you're cutting it down, you hit the middle of the nest with a chainsaw. They get kind of angry. And by kind of, I mean really angry, and they bite really hard a lot. Okay, so uh, if you're ever cutting down a tree, okay, um, give it a tap, and if it's hollow, cut carefully, okay, because it might be full of carpenter ants. And when you hit the nest with the chainsaw, okay, where does the chainsaw spit all the sawdust? Anyone ever used one before? No, it's yeah, right or on you. If you if you're twisting it to try and it gets on your legs, that's when I hit the nest right there. Instead of spitting sawdust, it spit angry carpenter ants. Okay, yeah, onto my legs. Yeah, wow. Not fun. Okay, uh, so this part we're going to skip. This is kind of just showing you some, some pictures of what the stem looks like again. Okay, so you've got your um, vascular cylinder. That's kind of where your xylem is. Okay, you've got your phloem near the outer edge. Okay, and stuff like that. We're just going to skip through that stuff. Okay, the last couple of things here. Different types of plants. Hydrophytes are plants that are well adapted to living in very, very wet conditions, possibly even partially flooded conditions. Okay? So most tropical rainforest plants, or if you've ever been to like the mangroves, those types of plants are hydrophytes. They can survive having their roots submerged for long periods of time, even permanently. Okay? Um, they can survive that. In fact, they can thrive in that. Right? Plants around here don't do well in that situation. Okay, and zero fights are the opposite. Okay, they're the ones that uh, can tolerate extreme dryness. Okay, period, long periods of drought. Okay, uh, your succulents and your cacti are going to be exactly with zero fights. Okay, I'm going to give you guys just a quick break.